Hi there, it's Florence here and it's been a few weeks now since I last uploaded an episode of my knitting video podcast. Today I'm back with another one. This is going to be a very typical sort of knitting podcast structure. So I'm going to show you the projects that I'm currently working on and also everything that I've finished since the last episode. And I have a tiny bit of yarn to show, but just like a very small amount. As usual, I will jump straight into this episode and start off with what I'm wearing. If you watched the last episode, this will be very familiar to you because this jumper I just finished in the last episode. This is my yellow jumper. We're just going to call it the yellow jumper. That's all the introduction it needs given my previously very beige knitwear selection. This is partly freehand and partly based on the pattern for the chestnut sweater, which is by Petite Knit. Really the only parts of the pattern that I used were the stitch count for how many stitches around the bust and like the armhole depth, I guess. The shoulder construction on this one is different. The collar is different. I didn't bother reading the pattern for the sleeves. So you can definitely use that pattern to get a similar look, but it's not exactly what this jumper is. The reason why I opted to use that pattern was because of the yarn that I was using. This is knitted in San Miscan Pier Gint, which there's going to be a lot more of in this episode actually. And that pattern is written for San Miscan Pier Gint, so it worked out really well. And I think I based the stitch count off the size extra small. Petite knit patterns tend to run very large. I think this is about correct gauge wise, and you can see how big this is on me, even for the extra small. I am not a particularly small person. Um, I think my measurements do fall into the extra small category according to petite knit sizing, but I am not particularly petite. I think the yarn colour is 2122. I always forget these things. Samus Garn don't have colour names or they don't have colour names on the packaging of the yarn, at least. But I think this one is 2122. It's a very pretty uh, kind of cool yellow colour, I guess. I felt it matched quite well with the fairly cool palette the rest of my knitwear has. Anyway, I don't want to go on too much about this jumper since I did speak so much about it in the previous episode. I guess I will jump straight in with my finished objects. I have, I think, three finished objects to show today and three things that I'm currently working on. And I'll go for the biggest one first. It's going to be this green cardigan. I did show this in the last episode, at which point I think I had knitted uh, some of the yoke. I don't think I had at that point quite split for body and sleeves yet. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But now I have the whole thing finished. And as of this morning, I have sewed buttons onto it as well. I'm going to try and be as methodical as possible when I talk about this because I don't want to miss anything and I feel like I normally jump between a lot of different information in a very unstructured way. Um, so I guess I will start off by talking about the pattern, or rather lack of pattern, for this particular cardigan. I knitted this one freehand, basically, um, and unlike the yellow jumper, I didn't base any of the numbers off anything in particular. Uh, I just did some calculations in Excel, which is what I normally do when I want to freehand knit something. I knit up a swatch first, I measure the gauge from that, and then in Excel I do some calculations based on my measurements and the amount of ease that I want and so on to figure out how many stitches I want for the body and for the sleeves or whatever else. Obviously calculations are only going to get you so far. This one does have one sort of significant fit issue which is not related to any of my calculations and more related to the fact that I wasn't trying it on frequently enough as I was working on it. I was quite enjoying knitting the body just happily going back and forth in broken rib and I didn't notice that it became long enough. I am not particularly a perfectionist in my knitting, which is something that I always end up regretting. So when I make a mistake or something is not quite how I want it, normally I just have a bit of a, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine, it'll block out kind of attitude. Which is a problem for this cardigan because uh, I ended up knitting it a little longer than I would perhaps want it. And then you pick up stitches along the front opening of the cardigan to do the double knitted button band and then you pick up stitches from that double knitted button band to do the collar. So to adjust the length of this cardigan, with a jumper like this it's really easy, I could just cut some off with scissors um, and then like pick up some stitches and knit it back to the length that I want. For this cardigan I'd have to redo the collar, the button bands, take off all the buttons. It would be kind of a giant pain to adjust the length and so I should probably have changed the length immediately after I realised it was too long, um, because now it's not really something I can do. 
it's not crazy long or anything. Um, I think I just like my cardigans a little bit shorter than my jumpers in general. So I guess this will be more of a wear with jeans sort of cardigan than a wear with skirts or dresses sort of cardigan. And I think that's okay. I'll show some of the details that are included in this cardigan. First off, it is a raglan. I was saying I hadn't knitted a raglan in quite a while, I didn't think, and it was making me feel quite nostalgic, going back to the really simple sort of raglan where you just increase one stitch on each side of the markers every other round. And I also really love how raglan increases look in this broken rib. I just think it's kind of pretty, no? I also really like how uh, at the bottom it transitions from the broken rib to the regular rib. I just really like that change um, on all garments that have this sort of finish to them. I think it's really pretty. For the button band, I wanted to do double knitted. The reason why I wanted to do a double knitted button band is because I felt that with the broken rib all over, if I added a rib button band, it would almost end up too busy like that rib on the bottom band might clash with the rib on the rest of the cardigan. And so I wanted that really clean, um, double knitted button band. This was easy enough to do. I basically did it like I always do on a v-neck cardigan, just up each side separately. One cool thing, or like a piece of advice for you guys, if like me, you particularly enjoy petite knit patterns because of some of the techniques that are included, like neat ways of doing things, uh, you should definitely check out the video tutorials that are recommended in the Petite Knit Patterns. I forget the name of the woman who makes them, I'll put her channel name in the description, I guess. Uh, but there are basically a bunch of tutorials there that are made specifically to go along with Petite Knit Patterns, and I think they're sort of Petite Knit endorsed. Which means that you don't have to buy the Petite Knit Patterns to learn the techniques that are really cool that are included in them. I don't know if this is a Petite Knit original technique or if it's been around for a while, but in one of the most recent Petite Knit patterns, I think it might be the Jenny jacket, but the v-neck one? I think I saw like a smock stitch in the tutorial, so I'm guessing it's that one. There are buttonholes in the double knitted button band that are done without breaking the yarn. If you've done a double knitted button band before and you've done the sort of buttonholes where you do double knitting, and then you'll sort of divide your stitches in two and do double knitting at one side, double knitting at the other, and then put them back together and continue. You'll know that knitting one side, then knitting the other, and putting them back together leaves you with a few extra ends to weave in at every buttonhole, which is very annoying. And I looked at this video on how to do them without breaking the yarn and tried it, and it's life changing. So I strongly recommend, even if you aren't going to buy that pattern, you go and check out the tutorial video. Just in general, there are so many good tutorials there for how to do different things really neatly, and it stops you from having to buy like a million petite knit patterns you're not going to have time to knit. So yes, these are the uh, no yarn breaking double knitted buttonholes. They look really neat. Maybe I'll like undo some buttons so that you can see. They may be a little misshapen from having been buttoned just a second ago, but they look so neat and so seamless. Really, really cute. There are actually a couple of mistakes on this cardigan. I will expose myself for you guys. I was doing these buttonholes from the bottom of the cardigan up, and so this is the first one I did, and I actually miscounted the rows. So this side of the buttonhole has one extra row compared to this side. You can't really see that well, so I'm not really bothered. And it was another one where I realized right here, and then couldn't be bothered to go back and do this again. And now there's no changing it because I had to take off the collar and this whole side of the button band, and I'm not going to do that. Okay, so uh, that's the button band. I will also talk about the collar. As I said, for the button band, I wanted it to be double knitted so that it had a sort of cleaner look that didn't become too busy when combined with the broken rib on the body. And so I wanted to do the double knitted collar as well. I haven't done a double knitted collar on a cardigan like this before. Um, it actually, I think, worked really well. I was kind of worried that because it has way more stitches than ribwood, um, it wouldn't cinch in the same way, and that might give a sort of saggy collar, but actually it holds its shape really well. And it blocked out nice and flat, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. I just love how that double-knitted collar and double-knitted button band uh, match so nicely. 
So yeah, I'm declaring this color a success. I'll probably do something similar on some future projects. One thing that I might do, which I normally do with these sorts of cardigans, like not the v-neck ones, but the ones that are just like a jumper that's cut up the middle like this. Crew neck? <laughs> I don't know. I normally do a crochet chain along the inside of the collar, just because I feel like these cardigans in particular have a tendency to stretch out a bit at the collar. Maybe jumpers do the same thing and it's just more noticeable on cardigans, but I definitely find it does happen and so it's better to put that crochet chain in as a sort of preventative measure rather than having to deal with a stretched out cardigan later. Anyway, the oversizedness of this has been quite nice. I came back from my run this morning and I get really cold after I've been on a run. Um, and this was a bit of a lifesaver. Okay, that's the pattern covered, so let's talk about the yarn. I'm sure many of you will be able to identify the yarn just from the colour. I feel like it's a very distinctive colour. I knitted this cardigan in Knitting for Olive. Um, this is the Heavy Merino and this is the Soft Silk Mohair, and both of them are in the colour Fennel Seed. I really like this colour. I'd describe it as a warm green. Um, it's quite unique, I think. Sandiskan do a kind of similar green or like one with similar undertones, but I still think this one is super distinctive and it's a lot easier to find than the Sandiskan one. I bought, I think, eight balls of the heavy merino. These are 125 meters each, so I had a thousand meters, I think. I dropped out of my master's degree. And then I bought five of these, which is a bit over a thousand meters. And this is how much I had left at the end. So I didn't really have a lot spare. I don't really do the whole yarn chicken thing, I'd rather just buy enough yarn so that my knitting doesn't become a stressful experience. I don't usually cut it this fine and so I was a little bit worried about it, but it ended up being okay. And this did include a swatch, but it was only a quite small swatch. My swatches tend to be like so big, you know? This is a worsted weight, I think if you use it on its own, it knits up quite nicely at about an 18 stitch gauge. I've knitted many, many garments in both of these yarns and they are some of my favourites. This is a very soft mohair compared to something like Drops. So if you haven't tried any of the more 10 pound mohairs rather than the five pound mohairs, I think this is a really great one to start with. It is, I believe, made somewhat ethically. I don't know too much about that, but it's very, very soft and the color selection that I think all of do is really unmatched. I really need them to make a sock yarn. Like I wish they'd make a sock yarn with nylon. That's all I really need in my life, I think. I definitely find it much softer than uh, mohair like Rowan, for example, but I would say the Izzia is slightly softer. Very comparable, though, the Knitting for Olive and the Izzia. This one I know a lot of people don't like because they tried the Knitting for Olive Merino, not the heavy merino, the finger weight merino, and that one is definitely a bit softer than this one. But I really like this yarn for how sturdy it feels. It has a slightly dry texture, um, very matte, doesn't feel super wash at all, you know? It's not super wash, I should be clear but it really feels, you can tell that it's not super wash. It definitely pills a little bit. I think that's just a trade-off you have with some yarn that isn't so scratchy. This I find to be completely non-scratchy. Obviously, if you're very sensitive to wool, you might have a different experience, but as someone who's mostly not that sensitive to wool, this is brilliant for me and it's one of my favorite yarns. So yeah, these are lovely. I have used them many times before. I will use them again. I got a really oversized cardigan out of 1,000 meters. Is there anything else I want to say about this cardigan? I don't think so. Actually, I can ask your opinion on one thing. I tend to sew my buttons on with sock yarn because I feel like it's a little bit sturdier than whatever other yarn I have used for the cardigan. I've moved house, so I don't have all my sock yarn with me, and so I had to sew the buttons on with this light beige sock yarn. Do I leave it or do I get like a marker pen, like a Copic marker or something, and colour in <laughs> the yarn in the middle of the buttons so that it blends in more with the button than with the cardigan? You'll have to let me know what you think is best because I can't make up my mind and I'm really scared I'm going to get Copic on my cardigan if I try and do that. Okay, that's the cardigan covered, on to the next thing. Let's do the hat because I think that's like the least exciting, so let's get it out of the way. We have all seen Oslo hats before, I'm sure. It must be one of the most knitted patterns by knitting podcasters. I showed this in the last episode when I had sort of just cast it on, or rather the boyfriend had just cast it on. 
I was helping him learn to knit because he started off this hat and I started off one for myself as well. And then he sort of gave up halfway through and I ended up finishing it and his hat is now done. This is still damp. This takes so long to dry after blocking it because of the three layers, or rather I guess six if it's lying like this, of stockinette you have around the, the brim of the hat. But I think it's going to be really cute when it is dry. Pattern is the Oslo hat by Petite Knit. It's not the Oslo hat mohair edition, it's just the regular Oslo hat. I don't really know what the difference is between the two, even the gauge difference seems to be negligible and I've knitted this pattern up both with fingering weight and mohair and with DK weight and no mohair successfully, uh, so you definitely don't need both patterns I'd say. I think this is the medium size, uh, this is the size that I've always knitted for my boyfriend and for myself and for everyone else who's had an Oslo hat, it seems to work great. This is a very easy and very beginner friendly pattern. You start off by knitting a big stockinette tube, then you fold it, and then you start doing more complicated things like knitting stuff together and decreases and whatever else. So if you're a beginner, you get a lot of practice just making a good stockinette tube before you have to move on to do anything more complicated. And therefore I think it makes a really great first project if you have more patience than my boyfriend and could finish the whole thing. Anyway, uh, I finished it so he has a cute hat at least. I don't have much else to say about the pattern, I'm sure you've seen it before. The yarn, again, you've probably seen before, it's not very exciting. This is Samus Garn Double Sunday. The colour number will be here. Again, I don't remember Samus Garn colour numbers. It's a beautiful blue. Uh, I feel like this is a really statement coloured hat. My boyfriend chose the yarn for this himself when I took him to the Oxford Yarn Store and I am a little bit jealous of it. I think it's really cute. He is quite sensitive to wool. And this yarn in particular, it's a non superwash DK Wick Merino. It is probably the softest non superwash non cashmere yarn that I've tried. So if you want a wool yarn that isn't itchy, this is one that I really would recommend. It has a very round shape to it and gives a very even stockinette fabric. It looks really beautiful. I think it would work really well with cables or something like that. And the colour selection is really good. It's a bit more saturated than the Knitting for Olive colour selection, but it's still really pretty. For this hat, I didn't exactly follow the measurements in the pattern. Um, I didn't use a ruler at all <laughs> to like, check the length of each section before I moved on to the next one, and so I can't guarantee exactly how much yarn you will use, but I use less than two balls of this double Sunday to finish this hat. I think if you're following the pattern exactly, you would need to start a third ball. This hat is a little bit shorter than the one that the pattern talks you through how to make, just because neither me nor my boyfriend like having room at the top of our hat. And the pattern does leave you with a little bit of that space at the top of your hat. I'll see if I can find the yarn so you can see how much I have left. This is what I had left of the second ball. It's a pretty small amount. And I've knitted this hat for him before in a different colour of Double Sunday, a dark green, and for that one I also didn't measure anything and I also used less than two balls. So I think if you're determined, you can definitely get this hat out of two balls of yarn. But, you know, if you're a beginner and this is your first project and you don't want the stress of worrying about how much yarn you have left, maybe buy three. Other than that, I'm just throwing that into my project bag. Great pattern, great yarn, really enjoy it. And I will now move on from the Oslo hat so you don't have to listen to me talk about the most overknitted pattern on knitting YouTube for any longer. Luckily, the next finished object is something original, so uh, it won't be something that you've seen before other than on my own channel. I finished the second sock from this pair of socks. This is the Mountain Walk Chunky sock, and it's basically like a DK weight version of the Mountain Walk socks, which are the patterns I released almost a year ago, I think. So that's a sock that's knitted on 2.25mm needles with fingering weight yarn. This one is knitted on 3mm needles with a DK weight yarn. Okay, so talking about pattern. This was not especially complicated for me to write because I had knitted these at a tighter gauge before. So I already knew what I was doing in terms of the cables and I was sticking to my tried and tested favorite sock techniques. So it has a slip stitch, heel flap and gusset that's just how I find socks fit me the best, and it is knitted cuff down. I think I've mentioned this a few times on this channel, but the reasons why I prefer knitting socks cuff down are I like my socks so pretty, even when they're not on my feet. 
I hear a lot of people being like, it doesn't really matter if your socks flare out at the top because you can't see it when you're wearing them. And yeah, that's true, but also I like them to look nice when I hold them off in my video. So you get a much neater cast on edge than you would bind off edge if you're knitting the socks toe up. I still haven't found a bind off that looks really neat and doesn't flare up at least a little bit. So yes, a long tail cast on works great for socks. I've never had an issue getting it over my foot and it gives such a pretty finished object. Also, I don't know exactly why, but I just have a harder time getting top socks onto my feet. They don't seem to fit me quite as well, and I've never really understood why. I mean, when you think about it, the way a heel flap and gusset is constructed does give a slightly different shape if you knit them the standard way toe up to if you knit them cut down, so maybe it's to do with that. I don't think it's particularly the top edge of the sock, because even if I use a really stretchy bind off, I still find them harder to put on for a sock at the same gauge with the same pattern and number of stitches. And the third reason is I don't like how the side of the heel flap looks when I knit the heel flap top. I always think the edge of this heel flap looks so neat where I've picked up the stitches. Um, and I don't really mind picking up stitches. It's not like I have to use a second needle or anything. So yeah, cuff down is the way for me. I currently have some people testing this pattern, so it should be out pretty soon. I am only giving them like three weeks to knit one sock because you can knit one of these socks in a day really easily. And after that, I will be releasing a pattern. I'm very aware of the fact that some people have already paid for the mountain walk socks and therefore they're getting definitely less value if they want to also get this pattern. So I'll try and do like a code or something where if you already have that pattern, you can get a big discount on this one. Since it took me less effort to write this pattern as a result of the effort I put into the fingering white version last year. Oh yeah, I should mention the cables. They have this ribbed cable design and these cables are all mock cables. So you don't ever have to take stitches off your needle um, to switch them around or anything. It's just made by knitting into the second stitch along and stuff. So I find that helps me keep my flow up when I'm knitting. Like I don't have to pause to do cables and so these come together a lot faster than socks which have actual cables in them. But I think they look pretty uncockable as the cables. Like they really do look like regular cables, I think. Yeah, I think that's all the points I wanted to share about the design. The yarn that I used, see I have this thing where I always mix up Sunless Garn Perfect and Sunless Garn Smart. They're both superwash. I'm going to double check so I don't say it wrong this time because I did say it wrong in the last video. Okay, yes, this is Sandless Garn Perfect. And that is the yarn from Sandless Garn, which has nylon in it. So this is a wool and nylon blend. It's great because I think it's a lot harder to find DK weight sock yarn, which has nylon in, than it is to find cream cream weight sock yarn that has nylon. And for me, nylon, it's not something I'm willing to compromise on. I have never gone through a pair of socks which had nylon in. I have never not gone through a pair of socks that did not have nylon in. So if I'm going to put the effort into netting a sock, I really do want it to have nylon in. I guess the DK weight sock, since it's thicker, you can probably get away with not using a designated sock yarn with nylon, but it's a risk I don't particularly want to take. On that note, you can probably also knit this with two strands of finger weight sock yarn, which would make it a lot easier to find a DK weight combination, or with one strand of fingering weight and one strand of mohair. That works great as well. Oh yeah, I guess this is sort of relevant to the pattern, but also the yarn. Um, the sizing on these socks. So this sock has an eight stitch repeat going around it. Since it is a two by two rib and every other one of those ribs is a cable. And so when I'm writing the pattern, I have to increase the circumference of the sock in increments of eight stitches. Because eight stitches is so much at this gauge, I can't really write different sizes for this sock because they'd just be way too small or way too large. So what I have done instead is I've written what I think is quite a good guide in the pattern to how to get different sizes by changing your gauge. And so this pattern can also be knitted up in worsted weight or sport weight, um, two different gauges to get the different sizes in the pattern. I think this size would work fine for most adult women though, especially because if you're knitting up DK weight socks, it might be as more of a house sock, and then I don't feel like the fit matters quite so much. I made my sister a pair of DK weight socks a long time ago, a couple of years ago now, and they were the petite knit Sunday socks in Phil Kalana Peruvian Highland Wool, and she calls them her, what does she call them? 
her anxiety socks. She wears them when she's anxious and hungover. You know, that sort of use of a sock. I like socks like this very much. Yes, so in terms of my experience with this yarn, I bought two balls. I mentioned in the last video that each of these socks takes exactly one ball. So I cut the whole thing very fine. I did manage to get both socks out of the two balls of yarn, which is something I was stressing a lot about. And it's why these socks took me so long because I was like, I don't want to work on these if I'm not going to be able to finish them. But I did eventually finish them and I did manage to get them out of that amount of yarn. If you have larger feet than me, buy three balls. I have quite big feet. I'm like a EU 41 maybe, or a UK seven and a half. I know that doesn't seem that big, but I'm quite a small person. So <laughs> I think it is quite large. Also, if you want to make them longer, obviously these aren't the longest since I was uh, trying to make my yarn go further, but I'm really happy with the result. The yarn felt really good to knit with. I don't really have any complaints about it. It feels like wool. It's not too shiny looking like superwash often is. You can't really feel the nylon in it, which I know you're probably thinking, can you ever feel nylon in sock yarn? Yes, I have had sock yarn where you can feel bits of plastic in it, which is very strange. Basically, this just feels like a very standard, nice sock yarn. I got it on sale, so I think it was a great deal, and I would strongly recommend it to anyone who wants to make a pair of DK weight socks. It's a great yarn for the job. My camera is about to die. I don't have a second battery or anything. I should probably get a second battery and also a mic. I think that would make you guys happy if I finally bought a microphone after being on YouTube and doing it as a part-time job for coming up on 10 years now. Okay, I'm going to take a camera charging break. Okay, I'm going to show the projects that I'm currently working on. I actually have two super exciting garment projects that I really am looking forward to showing and an accessory as well. So I'll do the accessory last. I guess I'll show the one that I'm furthest through first. This is going to be the step-by-step -step cardigan. I'm sure many of you guys found my channel through the tutorial I made about a year and a half ago for the step-by-step -step sweater, which is a sort of hour and a half long walkthrough on how to knit your first ever jumper. I've had a lot of requests since then to make a cardigan tutorial video in the same sort of style, and I'm finally getting around to doing that. I made a poll on my Instagram story I think quite a while ago where I asked whether people wanted a round neck cardigan or a v-neck cardigan and whether they'd rather have a ribbed or a double knitted button band. And the v-neck with double knitted button band won by miles. Obviously this isn't the most beginner friendly thing to do, at least compared to the ribbed button band, but I think the most important thing when you're knitting your first project is to make something that you really love. And so if that's the most popular style, that is what I'm going to show how to do in the video. So this is going to be a v-neck. It doesn't yet have the double knitted button band, but that will be going on soon. It is just a very plain raglan construction because that's what this really calls for, being a beginner friendly tutorial. Stockinette, rib around the bottom. And the yarn that I'm using for this one is super special. I think I showed this as an acquisition in the last video. Um, this is Noro Madara. The colour is 01, I think it's called Sake, and the thing about this yarn is it is very expensive and for a long time it was out of stock everywhere in this colour. I was waiting for like a year to get my hands on some of this um, when it finally came back in stock at my friend Valentina who has the yarn shop in my every room at her shop. I bought it straight away. I don't know if you can see, maybe I'll come a little bit closer to the camera so you can see better. It's like a grey colour, but it has all of these really beautiful rainbow flecks in it. Lots of red, green, blue, yellow, really just these very primary rainbow colours scattered in amongst the grey. I think this is pretty standard for a Noro yarn. They do a few yarns that are like this, neutral but with flecks of colour. I know that the Noro Silk Garden Sock Solo in colour number one is super popular for a similar reason. I think Petite Knit has used that one for the Chirazzo sweater. That is never in stock as well. I've been trying to get more of it for more than a year now and haven't been able to. Um, something that I particularly like about this one, uh, this is the Madara, is it's surprisingly soft. The Noro yarn that I've used, the neutrals with a lot of texture and uh, 
colour variation, which I really enjoy. They tend not to be very soft, they have quite a lot of mohair in the middle of the time. I'm not sure what the yarn content of this one is off the top of my head, I will put it here for you. Um, I think it has quite a bit of alpaca in it, but it's actually really, really soft. It feels really good, and I think if you're not particularly sensitive to wool, this would be easily next to skin soft. So if you're looking for an interesting Nori yarn and you don't want something that feels quite scratchy, this would be the one that I recommend. It also knits up at a way thicker gauge than I thought it would, even without any mohair or anything. You can knit it up very easily on 5.5mm needles. I think the first swatch I made was something like a 14 stitch gauge, which is huge, and when I blocked it, it really fluffed up and filled in all the gaps and looked really beautiful. So you can really knit this up at a, a range of gauges. It's definitely a yarn that sometimes is thicker and sometimes is thinner, but not as much so as some of the other Nora I've tried. So I think this one works better without mohair than some of the others. The one that I used for the step-by-step -step sweater, which I've now forgotten the name of, is it Nora Tenen? It might be Tenen. Um, that one definitely didn't look so great when I tried knitting it on its own at like a 16 stitch gauge, because when the yarn got very thin in some places, it left the fabric looking quite uh, sparse. There are definitely some spots on this where the yarn has become quite thin, but nothing was bothered me particularly, and I think it will block out a lot and look really nice. Maybe on the very thin areas, once I'm done with this cardigan and I've blocked it and I know how it's going to end up looking, I might just cut some extra little bits of this and like sew it, uh, sort of duplicate stitch on the inside of the cardigan so that those sections aren't at all transparent. We'll see if I deem that necessary once I have washed and blocked it. This also has used way less yarn than I was expecting. I think I've just started my third one of these. Yeah. I think this is the third, and I literally just joined it, and I finished the body, so I think this will take like well under four, which is quite impressive. It's quite an oversized cardigan, so um, yeah, I was happy to see it require so little yarn. I will definitely put like a better estimate of how much I used in the pattern, because this yarn is very expensive, so if you do choose to use it, if you can get away with buying only four of them, that is great. I think I spent around £20 per tank on this, and I bought five. So that was quite an expensive project for me, and I'm happy that I'm at least really loving how it's turning out. The reason why this isn't done, basically, is because this is something that I'm filming as I work on it for this tutorial video. I can't really make progress on it if it's not light and I don't have my camera set up. So this has been sitting for like a, a week, or even more than a week now, waiting for me to bind it off, because then I need to sit down and film how to bind off, and then film how to pick up stitches for the sleeves, and so I can't just start doing it late at night. I work pretty, not like crazy long hours, but proper full-time hours, like 9am till 6pm, and I walk like an hour each way to work, and so I'm not really at home during the week, during daylight hours at all. And so I can only really work on this at the weekend, and even then during the middle of the day, because it's so dark in the UK right now. The weather is really bad, it's really wet and wintry, and it just makes it hard to work on videos like that. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to having it done, I think I'm going to really like it, and it will be a less oversized cardigan than the green one, so different use case. Okay, on to the next garment I have on the go. This was a bit of an impulse cast on, to be honest. And I'm really sorry, this is another petite knit pattern. This is the petite knit Celeste sweater. I cast this on quite late last night actually, and I've done a nice little chunk of the yoke so you can see how the colour work is starting to look. Me, colour work, <laughs> I am not a very quick colour work knitter, I knit English style, so colour work is not super easy for me to do. I seem to knit roughly one colour work project per year. In the past, I've mostly knitted Sorry Nordlin patterns. She has a bunch of colour work jumpers that are knitted up at around an 18 stitch gauge, so they're quite quick to do. I can knit one up in a week, and I've done one in the winter for the last couple of years. I was wanting to try a different design this time, um, and I was really thinking about knitting the Northern Augustans number one, I think it's called, by Augustans DK. It's a really beautiful colour work jumper with all over colour work, mostly like a complicated yoke. And the thing that put me off that is I was getting a little bit confused by the gauge. The gauge is listed as, I think, 16 stitches with two strands of fingering weight held together. And I'm just having a hard time getting my head around how that works. 
16 stitches is kind of a hard gauge to find yarn that you can knit it to. That sentence did not make any sense. You understand what I mean though. And also, I think of two strands of fingering weight as like a slightly thicker DK. Maybe I'd knit it like a 20 stitch gauge, and so I wasn't really sure how to uh, achieve that 16 stitch gauge. So I didn't really know what yarn I would buy for it, and I was stressing about it a lot. And then recently, Petit Knit has been posting a bunch of pictures of the Celeste sweater. I think Petit Knit has been releasing a whole load of patterns using Samuskan Peer Gint, which is the same yarn that I used for this yellow jumper, because she's done a whole load of collaboration colours for this yarn with Samuskan, and I guess it's like a promotional thing, trying to get people to buy them. This worked. I went into my yarn shop yesterday to buy yarn for this, and the main colour I'm using, which is this sort of marzipan looking one, I think this is like an old pigment colour, but all of the four contrast colours that I'm using, I noticed when I was removing the uh, ball bands, are petite knit collaboration colourways. So clearly she has very much roped me into buying a bunch of her special collaboration yarn. It's very nice yarn and it's not overly expensive, so I do recommend it to anyone looking for wool on a budget. I guess I'll jump straight into talking about this yarn. Um, for a little bit. This is a 100% Norwegian wool yarn. To me, it's a very standard wool yarn. I get asked a lot by people, is pig and scratchy? Can you wear it next to skin? I would say that if you're sensitive to wool, you will definitely find this scratchy. I don't find it to be an exceptionally scratchy wool. I don't find it to be soft. I can just about wear it next to my neck, but I'm definitely kind of aware it's there. And I think if you have any kind of wool sensitivity, you might want to give this a miss or only miss it for garments that are not going to touch your neck or anywhere else that you find you're particularly sensitive to wool. It comes in pretty small balls. It's not quite as cheap as you think it's going to be because I think it's about 90 meters per 50 grams, which is really not a lot. But these cost around four pounds each, a little under four pounds each, I think, in my local yarn shop, which is definitely a good deal. And so you can knit the jumper up for not so much money. The colours that I use, I will try and show you, even though some of them are attached to the jumper still, are these five. So a cream, a mid-brown, light beige colour, this darker brown, and then a mid-blue, and this one is a really dark navy. I thought that the pictures Petit Knit posted, which had a very sort of high contrast yoke with a very pale colour and also something with almost black, looked really good, so I wanted to include this much darker colour as well to get that contrast on my version. Actually, I'm not going to claim that this is my own original idea. This colour scheme that I'm using is totally ripped from a picture that Petit Knit posted of herself knitting the baby version of this jumper, and I just thought it was totally my colour with the blues and the beiges, and so this is what I ended up getting. Onto the pattern and why I ended up picking this one and some things that I think are kind of cool about it. The yarn consumption, actually. So something about colour work jumpers is you end up buying a lot more yarn than you need because normally I'll buy a little bit more than I need to be sure that I'm not going to run out. And if you're doing that for every single colour in the colour work jumper, especially if it's something like this that uses five colours, you're going to end up spending quite a lot. But this jumper's really cool because I think the colours are pretty evenly distributed throughout the yoke. So each of the four contrast colours are used quite equally. And as a result, I think for all the sizes, but I'm not 100% sure, it only uses one ball of each of the four contrast colours, and then just a bunch of your main colour. I just thought that was really appealing. Like, one ball each, that's not so bad. And so it makes a five colour colour work yoke a lot more attainable, um, whereas normally I would think twice about buying the yarn for it. Also, this is one of those sort of traditional uh, Fair Early sort of colour works where you're only going to ever be using two colours at once, even though there are a lot of colours going on which makes the knitting of it a little bit easier if, like me, you're not exactly a huge colour work knitter. It does have short rows, I haven't got to them yet, they're, I think, below the colour work, but I'm looking forward to that. I've knitted a few round yoke things with short rows below the yoke, and they generally fit me quite well. You know what? I'm going to stop for a second and bring this over so you can actually see what this colour work is looking like. It's quite pretty, right? Like, with the blue and the brown. I think it's a really lovely colour scheme. And these floats are looking really, really cute as well. I just know I'm going to love this one. I don't know, it's a shame that I didn't end up going for a design that I haven't knitted so much from before. Maybe I'll try and do that next time. But this one was really speaking to me and I think the yoke is really beautiful. 
I sent some pictures of it to the rest of my family and I was like, guys, do you want to all knit these for Christmas so we can match like me and my mum and my sister because they both knit as well. And they were all like, uh, no. So I'm going to be the best dressed at Christmas and they can not match with me. And they're going to regret it because this is going to be so cute. Oh, one more thing about that Celeste sweater. I don't know when Petite Knit started including an extra size in her patterns. This comes in a size extra extra small, which is great because as like I said, this is like an extra small chestnut sweater and this thing is huge even on me. I decided to knit a size small for the Celeste sweater because I wanted it to be a little bit more oversized, even though an extra small would be my size by measurement. And so when I was checking the yarn quantities, I instinctively just read the second number in the list because that's always where the small is and bought that much yarn. And then when I got back, I realized that it, there's now an extra extra small. And so I accidentally bought the yarn quantity for the extra small instead. So we'll see if I have enough. That tripped me up, but I guess it is a good thing that there is an extra size. I don't know how many of her recent patterns have had that extra size, but I always felt like it was really necessary when even I have to hack her patterns sometimes to make an extra extra small that wasn't included in the pattern. I feel for anyone who's actually very small, you know? Anyway, uh, accessory. This I had just cast on, so I'm not going to talk so much about it. It's also not very exciting. I bought this yarn, I think I showed it in the last video. This is from Krenka and it's an alpaca boucle yarn. I wound it into two balls of like 25 grams each so that I can hold it double and I'm missing it on four millimeter needles. This is absolutely hellish to knit with. I haven't knitted with boucle in a really long time. I actually knitted a whole jumper in Boucle. I want to say two strands, maybe it was just one, um, but it was the Drops Alpaca Boucle and I knitted it years and years back. I don't even know where that jumper is now. It was very cute, like a grey boucle jumper. I don't remember it being that hard to knit, but this is stressing me out so much. You can't see any of your stitches. I'm making a headband, just a plain headband that I can wear sort of instead of a hat if my hair is tied up when I walk to work in the winter. So my plan was to knit a tube and then double it back down and knit the cast on edge together with the live stitches to create a double layered headband. But there is no way I'm going to be able to tell where the stitches from the cast on edge were because there is absolutely zero stitch definition in this at all. It's also super hard to knit without looking. Normally I knit pretty comfortably without looking. This, no way, because I'm going to accidentally knit through one of these boucle loops um, instead of a stitch and create extra stitches. And also you do have to be a bit careful with this yarn because it's one of those ones where if you grab and pull too hard, it does just break. So I'm definitely happy I'm holding it double stranded. I think it would also work well if it was held as something else. Maybe then it would be a little bit easier to see what's going on as well. Anyway, the finished result is beautiful. The yarn feels great. It's just causing me a lot of stress right now. Also, these needles are not remotely long enough for magic loops. So that's not making this process any easier as well. The finished objects had better be worth it, is all I'm saying. Okay, so that's pretty much it for my finished objects and work in progress pieces. At this point, I would normally show new yarn I've got. I did get the yarn for that Celeste sweater yesterday. Um, I did buy one other thing that I'll show you. I got a lot of yarn in the last episode, so I definitely haven't been buying so much this month. So I went to the Oxford Yarn Shop yesterday, which is a lovely shop to visit. I strongly recommend it. I speak about it very often. They sell a lot of Samus Gun, which is what I got for that Celeste sweater, and also a lot of Izzia. I mentioned in the last episode that I'm going to knit my boyfriend a zipper sweater, something that he requested for Christmas, and I got this yarn, which is the BC Gun Lock Lomond. I did knit up a swatch. Where is it? Here. And it meets gauge really easily, but it's not a very dense fabric. And I would like it to be just a little bit denser so that it's more of a warm winter jumper. And so because I know my boyfriend really likes this yarn, like every time I buy it, I make him touch all the yarn I buy and express opinions. He uh, speaks often about how he likes this one. This is the Izzy Alpact one. And so I got four balls of this. I have two here. I bought four to hold with this. This is actually not E2S, that one colour of Izzy yarn that I always seem to knit with. This is actually E3S, so I'm stepping outside my comfort zone here. I think E2S might have matched better, but oh well, it can be slightly mild. This is a lace weight 100% alpaca. It's much cheaper than using mohair and great for people who don't like mohair, like my boyfriend as well. It's a lovely yarn. 400 meters per 50 grams, you normally need like three to knit a jumper, even two. 
but this is a man-sized jumper and I'm not taking any risks, so we got four. Yeah, I'm excited to cast that one on. I should probably do it sooner rather than later because I feel like it's going to take me forever. The only thing is, I feel like I'm running out of needles. Like, between the Celeste sweater, which is on 4.5 and 4 millimetres, and the headband on 4 millimetres, and the ribbing on that cardigan, which is 4.5 millimetres, and then that jumper's all DK, so I assume 4 millimetres. I am really having a hard time with my single set of 4 and 4.5 millimetre needles. And so I think I need to get myself some new needles, which I haven't bought in two years now. I've been using the same set for two years. So maybe that will be something I show in the next episode, because I'm enjoying having a couple of different things on the go to work with. I've always enjoyed having one set of needles to limit how much I can have cast on. But I think it's time to like step it up a bit and get a second set. Yeah, we'll see if I do that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I am very proud of my camera for surviving for the whole thing. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back again soon with another one and goodbye.